here. Ah, okay. Uh, hi, hello, Chol. Uh, thank you very much, Nelly, for this uh, amazing initiative and for including me in this. Um, I'm following the lecture since the beginning of the course, and I found it so far fascinating. Actually, I, I include something because of the lecture of Simone, so we'll discuss a bit. It's a small point, but we'll have the chance to have a discussion, maybe. Uh, thank you, Nelly, for your introduction to my work. Um, like you said, I have a background in psychology. At the moment, I'm finishing my, <laughs> my PhD in gender studies. You can't, let's see. And um, I work as an educator to the of Center Revolution of Cyprus. All you said, I'm a triathlon athlete, athlete and in a way that practicing helps me to theorize part of my work with prisons. Um, currently, uh, I'm working also in some um, European projects within the LGBTQ community in Cyprus. I don't have an artistic or activistic background uh, like many of you, um, but um, I think what makes me engage with the youth of um, uh, underground is that I believe that it's important to expose ourselves to different ways of thinking and doing things. Um, so for me, in a way, doing triathlon is also something similar. I expose myself in a different way of doing things. Now, uh, what is also important to underline is that I'm coming from the periphery of Europe. I'm from Cyprus. Um, and in some ways, the experience that I have so far could be different uh, from your experiences. Um, I will return to that issue in a bit. So my lecture today, it's about the colonial and queer approaches in prison settings. Um, let's share my, um, my screen. Okay. Share. Can you see my screen? Yes, can. Great. Okay. Uh, so, let me the slideshow. So, my presentation is about um, uh, the colonial and queer approaches in prison settings. Um, my, my presentation is divided in four parts. Pro, first, I will present you, I will talk to you a bit. Elena, Elena, sorry. Yes. Uh, actually, we cannot see your screen anymore. So, if you want us to see your screen. Ah, you can't. No, we were and now we can't anymore. Oh, let me check why. Sorry. No, no, please don't. It's completely fine. Like. Yes. Now? Go. That's it. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> so it's not working if it's okay, if it's a slight um uh, if it's slide show. Okay, so um what I was saying is that my presentation is divided in four parts. First, I will talk to you about the process of learning from prisons, um, how I end up with this idea. Um, I will uh, present you uh, some parts from my chapter, Learning from, from, from Prisons, um, which is part of the edited volume, Decolonization and Feminism in Global Teaching and Learning. Uh, second, I will discuss some queer perspective in prison settings. and. Um, to the third part, I will make connections with the issue of prison as a reference point to the pandemic. And uh, to the last part, we can make um, a, a, a small um, con conversation. Um, what we will see to the prison as a reference point to the pandemic is that um, we, we see a kind of the act of surveillance that are em emerging in some countries, and we will discuss a bit uh, about, about that. So my discourse is a minoritarian discourse. Um, I'm following Deleuze um, in that point. And why is a minoritarian discourse? Because prison exists in the margins of society. Um, we can learn a lot from prisons as institution, as space, as subjects, um, as practice. But today we tend to approach prison um, and prisoners as objects of study. Uh, and not to question punishment um, or to question 
punishment practices, prison practices, or the expanding of prisons um, in the societies. Now, second, it is a discourse from the periphery of Europe. Um, I'm using as an example a very small unit uh, prison setting in Cyprus. The main prison is located in Nicosia. Uh, it accommodates around 700 of prisoners. Uh, minors and women and minors are accommodated in the same building but separate units. And it's a discourse which can measure up to the penal systems of big European countries like UK, like German, like France. So it's a minoritarian discourse. Um, so someone can ask, why is this minoritarian discourse then important? Um, in my opinion, it contributes to a more reflective way of thinking, theorizing, and acting about prisons. And as I hope to demonstrate today, it's now even more important to learn about prisons and to disseminate alternative knowledge about prisons. Um, so, learning from prisons, the process. Um, I began teaching psychology in 2010. Um, I was very much into into a psychological way of thinking at that moment. Uh, in that mainstream thinking, prisoners are manipulative, are dangerous, uh, sick, uh, very often seen as having personality disorders. Oftentimes, this perspective implies that uh, it's not easy to separate the bad and the mad. So actually prisons is the place for the mad and the bad of this society. Uh, very soon I realized that, that that approach wasn't enough to understand prisons, uh, prison as institution and prisoners as subjects. Uh, to this point where gender studies came in, um, three years following my work as a prison teacher, I decided to enroll in a gender studies PhD program. And my, my purpose was to explore the idea of learning from prisons on one hand, and if it's possible to contribute to an understanding of prisons, which is different from classical um, mainstream psychological approaches. Um, now, I have started thinking about learning from prisons. Um, my first year as a teacher there, when I asked students for feedback, I asked them uh, to write down what they learned from my lessons. And I didn't expect much because maybe many of you know that literacy levels are high among uh, prisoners worldwide. So the answers were very interested, short answers, but to the point, uh, Andrea said, I learned that philosophy could be interested in the stories of oppressed. Uh, here the prisoner referring, referring to a discussion about the ways that philosophy and social theory are engaging with the issues of Im prisoners, immigrants, oppressed, subalterns, and so on. Um, the second feedback I received, it was in the form of a short, let's say, answers, uh, went like this. Did you get something from the lesson? Nothing. Uh, did you remember any theory that makes you an impression? No. Um, what is your opinion about the group discussion that we have? It's pointless. Uh, and do you have any suggestion for the improvement of the lesson? No. That was Daniel, a prisoner, seven, uh, 45 years old. Um, I, will, I will return to his answer in a bit. Uh, the third answer was, what is more important is not to tell you what we learn from you, but to tell us what we, as prisoners, um, have managed to teach you. That was Christophorus. Uh, Christophorus here, it's, um, it's arguing that what is important is not what they learn, but what, what I learn. Uh, the approach of Christophorus uh, here is taking me exactly to the point in which you don't approach prisons and prisoners as objects of study, but 
uh, or uh, as a part of a situation in which you need to cure them or to reform them, but through the possibility to learn from prisons. Now, some important elements to understand why it's difficult, um, why it's difficult to learn from prisons. Um, let's read an abstract from Foucault uh, here to see how old is that idea of reformation that we are going to prisons, pre people of knowledge like me, they are going to prisons in order to change the prisons, the prison, the systems, and in order to engage with a rehabilitation process. Um, now, uh, the abstract is also connecting a bit the idea of prison with the current situation. I will return to that point later. Um, the abstract is from an interview that Foucault gave in um, 1975. Um, Nelly told me that she doesn't want to talk a lot about Foucault, so I will keep that passage uh, <laughs> short. Um, so Foucault argues to that uh, prison talk. My hypothesis is that the prison was linking from its beginning to a project for the transformation of individuals. People tend to suppose that the prison was a kind of refuse dump for criminals, and that was disadvantage became an apparent use, giving rise to the conviction that the prisons must be reformed and made into means of transforming individuals. But this is not true. Such texts, programs, and statements of intention were there from the beginning. The prison was meant to be an instrument comparable with and no less perfect than the school, the barracks, or the hospital, acting with precision upon the, its individual subjects. The failure of the projects was immediate and was realized virtually from the start. Now, what I want you to remember from that abstract, from that passage from Foucault, is three things. First, that prison aim is to transform the individuals. Second, that prison is an instrument similar and analogous with schools, with hospitals, and later we will see maybe airports, maybe zoom, museums and ETC. And third, that the failure of the reformation process, actually the fact that prisons are not working, uh, was known from its beginning. Now, um, we tend to believe that prisons are a dump, and my approach is coming to reverse that idea and to argue that we can understand prisons as source of information. Prisons are not spaces that are empty of information, and they are not only negative learning environments. I'm saying that because there is that idea that when someone is going to prison, uh, he will go, come out definitely worse. He will learn more, more ways to be a criminal. So it's not only that. It's that, but it's not only that. Um, now, to that point, to the idea of learning from prisons, uh, get me some decolonial approaches. Um, two ideas, I will present you two ideas. The epistemologies of the oppressed from Medina and uh, vulnerability in the pursuing of knowledge for uh, I Gaza. Let's start from uh, Medina. Um, according to Medina, there is a subversive lucidity, uh, which is often very found in people who, which are oppressed. Um, that knowledge uh, has certain epistemic char characteristics, um, modesty, uh, rigorousness, curiosity, and Thoughtfulness. I will add to that that in prisons and in discussing with prisoners, you can see also more raw and radical approaches uh, towards theory and life. Uh, of course, according to Medina and uh, some other writers who applied that idea in prisons, like McHugh, this is not the case for every person which is oppressed, of course and is not the case for every prison who is, every person who is in prison. Moreover, there is a risk 
with the idea of subversive lucidity. I'm, I'm including that to my chapter. There is a risk to romanticize imprisonment, to say that prisoners are, 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 are let's say, more, are better, or to aestheticize violence. Um, I think it's important to be aware of that risk, um, but at the same time, the fear of romanticizing um, should not keep us away from an engagement with prisons and um, prisoners. Now, the idea of uh, Igaza about vulnerability. Um, Igaza is a, it's a Mexican author, uh, an activist. Uh, she's currently in Rotterdam, and uh, she wrote that it's important to understand vulnerability in the production of knowledge. Um, vulnerability could be an embodied sensual experience in which the safety of how one knows things is relinquished. Um, for me, uh, vulnerability was, um, I saw vulnerability as a strength that disrupts a linear and Western understanding of the pursuit of knowledge. Uh, and it makes me to be open with my failures and my vulnerabilities in prison settings. Um, let's go back to the, to, the, to the second answer from the prisoner. You remember, it's part of the failures. You teach someone and then at the end of the year, he's saying that he didn't get anything. So it's important to embrace vulnerabilities um, when you are teaching in prison and beyond, I think. Um, I will read in you now, I will, I'm, I'm, I'm reading an example from my field notes in order to open that idea of failure and vulnerability more. Um, I need to tell you here that the idea of failure could be also connected with the queer out of failure from Halperstam. Um, I, will, I will talk a bit about that later. So now I'm reading an example from my field notes. Um, in 2010, I began teaching psychology in Cyprus Central Prisons. Alex, a tall, thin prisoner, only 23 years old, was there on my first day. He had been handed a life sentence at the age of 21. He came um, to class regularly. He had a sharp mind and liked to debate difficult questions about human nature. Although when the lesson included teaching that ran contrary to his beliefs, he was quick to become angry. Uh, his face ran turning red. Um, Alex uh, was one of the prisoners to constantly ask me about my own political beliefs. At the beginning of 2013, academic year, two years into my work as a teacher there, Alex asked to speak with me. He said that he had decided to take on studies at university. Owing a high school diploma, he wanted help from the authorities to apply to a local private university. I asked him what he planned to study. He said psychology. I remember feeling ambivalent about this. A part of me was proud. I thought that rehabilitation is possible after all, and you need, just need passion, love, consistency, and uh, when you teach and the results will come. At the same time, I thought, how did I manage to influence him to this extent? Did I do good? Was I ethical? What I was feeling was a relief that teaching or curing um, can have good implications. I told Alex to keep, to keep his option open, to look at subjects other than psychology, and left the topic there, feeling half sappy and half happy and half sad. Months, months later, they managed to secure him a place in the psychology department of a local private university, as he had wanted. But by then, he had stopped attending classes, including mine. I tried to reach him. I was unable to find him. Another prisoner told me that Alex has become tired and had become to self-isolate, preferring to stay in his cell. I, I became even worried, but there was nothing I could do. Two months later, in the summer of 
2015, Alex uh, decided to take his own life. What seemed to be a positive situation uh, at the beginning of the year became a failure. I was at a loss. My thinking tools, the, the, tools, of, the, the tools from psychology, um, was insufficient for dealing with such an event. I went to his funeral uh, with his other teacher. The prison administration made sure to inform the media that Alex had, had not been a high-risk prisoner, meaning, according to the manual, that he, he was not a foreigner, he was Cypriot, he was not experiencing mental distress, and he had been in prison long enough to have become institutionalized. Now, the, came, the case of Alex, uh, it's open to multiple interpretations. Uh, prisoners and ex-prisoners in my research talk a lot about him as very brave, as a chicken. Alex gave me a feeling of failure about my lessons in prison and what I have after to do, it was to embrace that failure and to embrace that vulnerability. At exactly this point, I start using decolonial and queer approaches in order to understand prison and prisoners in different and alternative ways. Now, um, let's move to the next part, which is, uh, I, I gave you the background and now we are going to queer perspective in prison settings. My current work is a combination of the above uh, with some concepts from queer theory. Uh, let's see first something about punishment and prisons, and then I will discuss a bit about pleasure, punishment, and imprisonment. Um, I will send you the link. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. You want to send it? Uh, just put it into the chat section. Okay. Let me. You didn't give it to me before, no? Because I think... No, 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 no. Yeah, that was, that was maybe better, but... Sorry, I don't know why, but I can't... That's it, you have it. No, 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 no. okay, wait a second. Well, maybe just try and press it and let's see what happens, you know? Oh, yeah, that's... Maybe then I will count. We might see it in slow motion, but we kind of get used to it. Yeah. And nobody can complain on that chat anyway. <laughs> you can see a bit, at least? Uh, wait. Is this going on? Yeah, now it's going. Let me take it a bit. Uh, Maybe just remove the PowerPoint and just show us, uh, put the PowerPoint in small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's see. Can you see a bit? I will, I will share it now. Where is the... Tell me if I can do chat. it. Chat. Okay. You have it now in the chat. Ah, uh, is it on the chat? Now it's in the chat. Ah, amazing. Amazing. Okay, so everyone can just watch this in their own computer. Yes. Go you. Perfect. Okay, we're watching. I'm watching.
So we are here. I think I lost. Uh, no, no, we all here. I think okay. everybody is watching. It's Clockwork Orange, right? Uh, yeah, it's great, great. I think if you pass it quite fast through the uh, camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Open. I think, yeah. I think, yeah. If you... everyone, which section do you want to kind of talk to us about? The, the section where the main character is talking to the politicians? Exactly, yeah. That's it and it's over. We can go back to the presentation. It will, I think it's four minutes. Maybe now it's over. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But I did something with my... Um, I don't know. With your presentation? I mean. Yeah, it's quite... A, I mean, no, you managed to... If you're to a certain age, you'll remember this next film very, very well. The Disturbed Life of Alex Delarge formed the storyline oh for Stanley Kubrick's 1971 film. Okay. Now, can you, can you still see my... my my perfect yes screen yes perfect. okay yeah. okay okay so um the the part was from uh Clockwork orange um if you didn't have the chance to see my movie it's amazing here we see the discussion about uh, the need for bigger prisons still relevant in some countries at least um, and the idea about the transformation of the Ale of Alex as the ultimate goal of punishment and imprisonment. Now, this is that, that idea is not unique. We can see that idea in, in many movies. What is important in that uh, specific part is when the government is arguing that prisoners enjoy their punishment and Alex is answering, you are absolutely right, sir. So let's start by, the, by examining why is the idea of enjoyment or of pleasure in prisons um, radical? Can you see my, my screen, right? No? Okay. Um, according to Hart, one, of the philosopher, one philosopher of the 60s, the first element of punishment is pain. Um, according to the most classic and the most cited text in criminology, uh, the text of Sykes, um, there are five pains of imprisonment, um, deprivation of liberty, deprivation of good and of autonomy, uh, deprivation of heterosexual relationships, and the deprivation of security. Now, um, what, what I understand when I'm reading those texts and in relation with, with my experience in prison setting as educator, and my readings in queer theory, I will talk to you in a bit, is that pain has one singular and one dimensional meaning. Um, it's definitely opposite to pleasure. So pain and pleasure is a binary and pain has a singular and one dimensional meaning. Let's see now, is that the case outside of prison? Um, for example, in piercing and tattooing, um, piercing and tattooing is one of those practices in which con they contain pain, but we understand pleasure, we understand the pleasure that they entail. Uh, in triathlon, uh, in similar sports, uh, people are investing a lot of energy uh, and they experience a lot of pain through the process. And there is a shared understanding of the fact that pain and suffering are in some ways connected with pleasure. Uh, now, of course, those cases are important uh, to understand that pleasure and pleasure are more connected, but still uh, it's the choice of people who are free to choose. Uh, yes, this is right. The case is not the same, but it could be Maybe I'm arguing that is analogous. Um, we need to understand pain and pleasure beyond the binary in prisons as well. That was what I'm arguing. And that the two notions could be more related and more connected in prisons as well. Now, back to prisons, there is no systematic, um, sorry, there is no systematic, um, 
I lost where I'm, yeah, let me see. I lost a bit my, uh, okay, that's, we are here. Uh, there is no any, any systematic um, framework to understand uh, pleasure in prisons. And some scholars, especially ethnographers, have identified some moments of pleasure, but that was framing as surprise or as contradiction. However, materials from my PhD, um, the interviews that I did, uh, incidents from my prison experience as educator, and queer readings helped me to understand that we need to understand prison experience, um, not only in terms of, of pain, but in relation to pleasure. Uh, now, let's go to queer theory. Um, I know that many of you, you are already familiar. You had also the, the, um, the class from Simone about queer grief. So queer theory can get many definitions. I will just give you what is working uh, for me now. Um, I'm borrowing a definition for Warner. Queerness bears a different relation to liberal logics and uh, to liberal logics of choice and will. And that queerness is often a resistance to regimes of their normal. Uh, that's, this is from Warner, the fear of a queer planet. And for Edelman, about queerness, every attempt to totalize, to construct a universal or close idealized political system will always exclude something, and that exclusion will be then the locus of queerness. Now, it's prison a queer place. Um, it's important to clarify if I see prison um, as queer subject, prison is a queer subject, prison a queer place. Um, actually, I have here um, a short passage, a short um, movie from Jeanette, um, but maybe we can skip it and I will just share it with you um, in the chat. Is that okay? Yes. Yes, that, because I think we don't have enough time. Uh, so, um, the 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 movies from um, from Jeanette, like I said, um, it's a trip to to queer uh, uh, moments uh, in prisons and beyond. In beyond, in my opinion, um, I think it's a difficult question to answer if prison is a queer place. For some criminology, queer criminologists like Ball in Australia, Spade and Cuzel in US. Uh, Prisons are queer places, and prisons, for a number of um, reasons, are places of interest for queer scholars. There is, again, the fear of romanticizing. If we approach prison um, as queer place, and prisoners are queer subjects. Uh, but I think that we still need to engage with them and be aware of that fear, of that risk. Um, now, for example, why is prison a, a queer place? Uh, prison sexual practices um, that take place outside the binary of straight gay exist. And through prisons, we can have a broader definition of what fluid sexuality is. Uh, at the same time, it's important to un underline some risk. Um, prison is a place um, in which uh, homophobia, sexism, racism, as violence are usually the norm. So when we approach with prison from queer, feminist, or this kind of lenses, it's important to have that in mind. Now, still queer theory could be very productive in order to understand and to theorize pleasure in prison settings. Uh, for me, um, I, I'm giving you here like a broader definition. Um, pleasure is a productive force uh, which produces effect, uh, is fluid, is desexualized, and in close, we can understand pleasure in close relationship with pain um, and resistance. Um, if you remember a passage from uh, Foucault about pleasure power and punishment, Foucault is arguing that they are very much connected. 
Now, pleasure institutions, ah, this is what, what I lost before. This is, um, I already said that about pleasure in prison settings, so, so we can skip that. Uh, in, my, in my research, uh, I managed to identify three categories uh, of pleasure. Pain and pleasure, pleasure and resistance, pleasure and sexuality. Um, I will give you some incidents here. Um, Robin, I can say that I spend my time in there um, as a king. Despite the whole coughling in there, I like it. If I didn't, I wouldn't have survived. Me. So basically, you were sat receiving satisfaction from this conflict with the authorities, Robin. Very much. No. Now, almost all the prisoners admitted the prohibition of certain objects had the opposite effect that was was intended. In then intended, as Robin said, anything that is banned in prison takes place. For example, drunks. If I want to use drunks, I will do it in any circumstances. And I think this is happening in prisons outside of Cyprus as well. Um, actually, the participants of uh, a study from Cruz in the UK uh, agree with what, what Robin said, um, because they, they argue that the pleasure of that drunk dealing is related with, to the comfort of an income. Prisoners, they can have more money to spend. Um, but also points to a larger theme of how the prohibition of an object of desire it brings emerged pleasure when that object is attained. Now, Phileas um, served five, served time in five different European <laughs> prisons. Um, was conscious of the fact that every act of violating the rules was a way of mocking the system. In prison, you can start any kind of noise, singing, screaming, or even praying, praying just for fun, just to make the officers angry. Now, I said that I will add something in relation to the presentation of Simone about anal terror, and this is the point. Um, throwing shit as an element of resistance. This is not from my research, but I'm including that, um, that example in order to discuss more about resistance and pleasure in my work. Um, now, some researchers give attention to the act of throwing shit in maximum security prisons or in political prisons. In the research of Rhodes, some prisoners, they are saying about that action. In this context, context, there is an element of attraction, even seductiveness, to this mimic and my, my manipulation of the body. It offers, among others, possibly more perverse forms of pleasure, an opportunity to play with meaning. In a work, world where your food is thrown at you through a hole, where the heat of your bed is next to your toilet, where toilet paper has to be requested, throwing shit says something. Uh, that was Roach. And for the prisoners in this study, there is, like I said, like Roach said, a seductive element and pleasure of what many of us will just understand and feel. Um, as disgusting. Now, pain and pleasure. Um, getting a tattoo secretly is common among men and women in, in prisons. Um, you can see here uh, some um, tattoos from the Russian Criminal Archive. Uh, there is an amazing collection. Uh, Moses in my study explained that testicles are common places also for piercing, um, but infections were also common. Um, the line be between a pleasurable activity like piercing and self-harm is blurry at this uh, point. Uh, now, let's go to the last category. Um, 
understand pleasure, sexuality and pleasure, for me, what is important to say is that um, we need to understand pleasure in sexual terms, but also beyond sex and beyond sexual activities as such. Uh, I'm using a quote from Zubazik here. For the moment I am not fucking, I am talking to you. Well, I can have exactly the same satisfaction as if I were fucking. Now, incidents from a trans um, prisoner, um, the case of Julia uh, reveals the complexities and ambiguities in discussing pleasure in prison settings because on one hand, it illuminates the complex administrative issues that arise in relation to trans prisoners, placement in prison, victimization and treatment, health care provisions. Julia had a hard time in prison uh, and her body um, creates a confusion, a body with press, with breast and a penis. However, she also took it with great pleasure about the ways in which she used her body to confuse the authorities and to refuse victimization. So uh, trans, um, Julia said, I demanded to have a provocative mini skirt so I will wear it with full on makeup with curl hair and my coffee sitting. So the prison guard could see me like this and become aroused. And if, and only if, I want it, I will have sex with him. If this is what you want, this is what I will give you. The experience of Julia suggests that while her body is the site of the conflict uh, for the authorities, the same time it offers her the possibility for resistance and pleasure in prison settings. Now, I need to go to the last part of my presentation, prison as a reference, as a reference point to the pandemic. Um, I don't know if you um, saw Ella DeGeneres. Um, now, what, what, uh, the prison became a reference point to understand the lockdown and the surveillance in the era of, the, of a pandemic. Uh, let's remember here the first extra, extract from Foucault about the ways that prisons, hospitals, schools, factories are similar or analogous. I will add that airports, museums, they are slowly, slowly come to be part of society which is in best to surveillance and to safety. And we need to have in mind that in, in Europe, refugee centers, camps are a sad reality. So this is the background in which we have prison as a reference point in the era of a pandemic. And of course, um, Ellen DeGeneres said that one thing that I have learned from being in quarantine is this is like being in jail. Uh, it's mostly because I've been wearing the same clothes for 10 days and everyone here is gay. Some people argue that the experience, um, the, their experience of time is changed and that people can come better persons after this experience. Of course, um, Ellen DeGeneres receives a kind, a kind of criticism from that point, uh, from that um, um, statement. Um, I will make here two points in order to understand that even if the pandemic uh, or the look time Irina, seems to... Irina, Ellen, just so you know, you are 10.47 uh, now. So yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I have <laughs> one slide more. We finish. Okay. Uh, so if this is not the case because prisons are often over or populated, hygiene standards are very low, um, and because of the pandemic and the difficulties that exist in prisons to access the healthcare system, uh, many prisons are on strikes in Italy, in Greece, in US, I think in, in uh, Latin uh, American countries as well, uh, from what I saw yesterday. Uh, now, about the pu public dialogue of a number of philosophers about surveillance after the pandemic, I just want to make a comment here that um, even if um, uh, we think that there, are, there, there is a possibility to understand prison as a reference point, we have some, some, um, 
some things here. And Gamben argued that um, uh, the world will change towards a bad direction. Uh, the state you will use the illness as an excuse to constantly monitor your body, your temperature, your contacts, all in order to save you. And argue that this stain of, of ex exception will be an excuse for more oppression from the part of the state. Um, I don't agree with him. Um, if we think uh, Foucault and what he said about power and resistance, then his approach is a kind of one dimensional. More uh, oppression from the state, more surveillance, but there is still a kind of power in resistance. And we need to uh, remember that. Now, final thoughts. If people experience a lockdown as prisons, um, what, what does that mean? What that, does that say about our understanding of prison? Uh, and should we expect to everyone to come out of the lockdown as a better person in the same way that we expect prisoners to become better persons? Done. I finished. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> okay, so Elena, we have uh, you have ten minutes of questions. So I guess there will be some sort some anyone want to kind of ask any question to Elena. That's the time to ask her. So you have can you see the comments as well, Elena? Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots coming in mind. Need a few minutes. Yeah, we've. Uh, you know it's, yeah yeah you you it's okay it's okay you you have some yeah. minutes i guess <laughs> yeah thanks for have, have a comment so maybe maybe i can just kind of make a connection with their brief as well and ask you what are the kind of the form and the shape of resistance that you you have noticed when you were teaching uh, your you know your classes for example when you were in prison yeah i think that Body, it's, it's the mean of resistance in prisons. Mm. So anything that you can do with your body, your voice, um, anything, it's, it's, a, it's part of the resistance. So there are a lot of, a lot of ways uh, to resist the authorities. Prisoners, they are, they are finding like uh, very, they, they find many ways to do to resist, uh, and I think it's 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 very important to to discuss with them how they 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 try to use their body and everything they know to just hide things, to to cook things that they don't have, to everything they can build things, uh, they can, everything. It's it's uh, yeah, and that that's why I use the the example of screaming to say about the body and also i think the, the throwing sheets sheet example it's 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 again important to understand the range of these forms so you have um you have tongue where are you tongue you had a a comment to give us yeah where are you tongue yeah ah, we hi. like your comments oh my god you're in the middle of where are you in alexandria laboratory <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I remember joking with a lot of people about how all these Zoom calls are basically people showing off their massive bookshelves, and I don't have one. <laughs> so this, I just Googled big bookshelf, and this is what I got. Um, I think it's in Chicago, by the way. Um, so uh, what was I saying? Ah, yeah, it's interesting because I was talking to someone about a gambling last night. Um, mm -hmm. And like she was very, you know, she's reading the same article about like, you know, a gambling cautioning that this is an expansion of the state in the state of exception. And what I find really interesting is that I didn't question it so much because I was just like, yeah, cool, right? Um, was that when you said that you disagreed with him, I was like, oh, it's, that's really cool because when I thought about it in relation to Foucault, um, you know, kind of bio biopolitical kind of institutions shaping us, 
the the whole point of the prison is that that is the state of exception that a gambling kind of creates. No, it's the place where you are punished. So those that are living outside of the state of the, the state of ex, uh, of exception, let's say, are the more kind of normal people, and they're the ones that are subjected to the state more. No, mm -hmm. so like when you think about queer people, um, migrants, people who are subjected to these forms of punishment, like myself, <laughs> you they are actually more conscious of these kind of um, structures of control and therefore resist more. In fact, they, in a way, they do by surviving, you know, as Audrey Lord says in the, in, the, in the space where, you know, you're supposed to not be alive, you are actually creating another state of exception in the state of exception that is a resist, which is resisted through surviving. So it's interesting that this kind of subjection, so the person I was talking to last night, she's like white British, doesn't necessarily, never subjected to these forms of control, but she mm -hmm. suddenly became aware of the ones that she was already living in as they became intensified to the point that is beyond the threshold of tolerance. Whereas I was, I, I was just like, oh, no shit, like, no surprise. Like, I don't, I'm, I'm not freaking out about this. And I, I felt really bad because a lot of, I had a lot of like panicking friends, like panicking about this virus. And I was just like, I was really chill because I'm like, I don't, I don't, I don't, whatever. It's not that new to me. So, yeah. Thank you yeah. for your comment. Uh, we have some question as well, um, yeah. Elena. It's yeah, okay. yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Very important comment. I, I totally agree with you. If we see only the one aspect, like biopolitics, more surveillance, more power from the state, we are losing, we are losing something. And queer people, they already experience their existence through this process. So that's why it's not easy to convince them that this is the case. I think that's my opinion. So let's see some of the you comments. Have a question from LV. Where are you, LV? I'll be read your text. I'm here. I really hi, hi. Hey, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was really great. Um, and I have a question that I actually got from reading your text about the difference between living from the margins and studying the margins. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very important uh, note for us as researchers as well. But then mm -hmm. I was kind of wondering, like, how do we avoid? Um, of falling in the pitfall of interacting with groups in a manner of studying instead of learning from them? Yeah, I think um, the, the, the process that I present before, like decolonial approaches in which you are open to your failures, you are open to your vulnerabilities, um, it's a way to engage with people without like having the power from above. I'm here to study you. So if you, if you let yourself to be with people without criticize, without thinking, oh, this is wrong. Imagine a person like a feminist to be in prison and hear sexism comments, racist comments, all these all this stories and comments from prisoners. And for me, it was important to engage with that. It's hard, but if you want to learn from from someone, then you need to be open to the ways that you don't want to be open. Mm -hmm. So that, that's my answer. I don't know if it makes sense for you, but to be open to your vulnerabilities, to your failures, to your blind, blind spots. We, only we all of us have some blind spots in our thinking. So it's, it's important to be aware of that blind spot. Uh, we have a question from Antoine, I'm guessing, Tinu. You're like always appearing in different names, so then you think I don't know who you are. Tinu? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Schizophrenic. <laughs> um, so I, I'm interested to know if there is dance in prison and is dance like a political way to express something like, like uh, slaves, which were like unpaid prisoners just like today in America, for instance, they used to, to go through the ban on drums by slapping their ties and uh, it gave some choreography or like maybe the, the, these guys also fight into dance and it gave birth to capoeira or they had labor songs that had double meanings. Um, yeah. So what are the like, artistic and especially like dance forms of resistance if there are any today in prison? Yeah, I think that 
there, there is definitely. I don't know a lot of things, to be honest. Um, I know that uh, we had some dance lessons in, 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 um, in Nicosia prisons. And of course, it was very important mean uh, for, for, the, for the prisoners. But I really, I, I didn't come across for anything similar like caboeira or um, drums. So I don't, I don't have a lot of things to say, but I will search a bit. And if I find something, I will return to you and send you something maybe. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, you have another comment from Jan, and maybe that's the last one before I know you have to go and finish your PhD. So, <laughs> <laughs> so where is Jan? Hey, Jan. I'm here. Hi. Hi. Uh, no, I just to know more about this term, antisocial turn. I uh, about the video that you. Put on the material of the yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, this is very important. I, I think um, you remember the, the abstract that I wrote about the locus of queerness. So for Lentelman, any idea of construct a utopian world, it will be fate. Because why? Because for him. What we, we need our differences, kind of. We pace who we are in our differences. Gender differences, uh, racial differences, and go on. So for Elterman, any, any exclusion for, for people that they are not engaged with that ideas will be the same, it will be exactly the same exclusion as the exclusion that queer people faced so far. So if we construct a world with vegans, with feminists, with, with uh, queer people, that, and all the others will be out, then again, we'll do exactly the same thing. I know it sounds radical, but it's his opinion. I can talk more about his work uh, because it's important to understand death drive in order to understand uh, his opinion, and I don't have much time now to present you what is death drive, but it's actually the idea from, Foucault, from Freud now that, that we have also a will to deconstruct, a will to destroy. So we will not just build a good work and that it's over. Every time we have like, a, 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 some of us will need to destroy something, to I don't know, to, to do something that, yeah, the, the, the others will not agree, let's say. That, okay, that makes you. sense? Yes, totally. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So are you willing to take maybe one last comment? Uh, Definitely, Anna? yes, yes, yes. So, so Anna, maybe, where are you? You mentioned... Ah, you Anna, yes, hi. yes. <laughs> hi, Anna, thank you very hi. much. Very interesting. Hi, hi. Yeah, uh, so I, I just wanted to share um, Georgian experience uh, yeah. uh, and I wanted to ask you about uh, um, is it common in other countries or not as well. So we have uh, like very horrible practice actually um, still when in prisons um, uh, like homosexuals but not only uh, they're uh, put in uh, different uh, buildings separated from others and they're uh, called uh, like uh, chickens and they're yeah. uh, treated like slaves and uh, no one can even handshake them and but they might can be raped uh, anytime by others and it's not considered as uh, considered as a homosexual uh, practice for others it is uh, just a tool for dominance and uh, this is like a tool for administration for government to control the situation in prison to uh, frighten the prisoners and to make them feel that anytime they can be put in this category even uh, so it's not only uh, it's not the place only for homosexuals but uh, for everyone who will not uh, follow the uh, rules, not only formal rules, but also informal rules, which is um, in, in these uh, places. And this is like 
continuing of the um, tradition of the uh, Soviet Union when we had this uh, criminals, uh, criminal groups who actually uh, controlled all the society. It was like an alternative government, actually, but it started from the prison. And mm -hmm. uh, it's still um, in, uh, like, it was very um, 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 big thing in the uh, whole society in our country as well. But we changed it a little bit, but it still has its, uh, like, power and influence in prisons, these closed institutions. And I wanted to ask you, is it something that is common in other societies as well still? Yeah. Yeah, um, w w I think um, they start in some prisons to marginalize, uh, to separate uh, homosexuals and put them in different prisons. Uh, so it's now, it's like a new thing uh, to separate them. I know that in, in Russia was a tradition from, from Gulag periods. Um, so, yes, it's, it's an important issue. Uh, and of course, uh, rape is also a fear for uh, um, feminine guys in prisons, guys that they, do, they are not so strong or they don't look so strong or so masculine. Um, yeah, or, and sometimes maybe even uh, they're uh, beautiful. That yeah. might be the reason to put them in this. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it exists. It exists uh, in other places as well, from what I know. Uh, and I think in Cyprus now they start putting them in a separate unit uh, with sexual offenders, which is really bad as um, decision. Imagine that you have some uh, gay people or bisexual men with sexual offenders. It's it's really really weird decision and it's the way that the the authorities decide to help the prisoners but this is a kind of second exclusion uh, with that thank we're you. going to say a massive thank you to you elena for joining us today and sharing with us uh, some of your knowledge and we can't wait to read your PhD and we wish you the best of luck with finishing it in this uh, difficult time. So that's that. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Nelly. Thank you so much. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 And Elena, Elena, if you want yes. people to email you, oh, if you want people to email you, maybe put your email. Uh, I, I will put, I think I, I have it on, on no, I will put my email here, here, sorry, it was my mistake. I will put my email now here and, um, or can I send it to you now? Um, I will write it, it's very easy. Maybe write it, but everyone be aware that uh, Elena is finishing her PhD, so don't ask like questions that will make her basically write her entire No, no. It's okay. I will be very happy. I will be very happy. You can write. That's me. amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Bye.